Tonight, the situation in Southern California growing more dire by the hour. Residents trapped in the mountains for nearly two weeks. That historic winter storm dropping feet of snow. Some residents unable to get food or medicine. A woman forced to deliver her baby without any medical assistance. Miguel Almaguer is with the teams going door to door delivering critical supplies. Also breaking tonight, four Americans kidnapped at gunpoint in Mexico. Shocking video appearing to show the moment a woman was forced onto the flatbed of a truck. The urgent effort now underway to bring those Americans home as we're learning more about why they may have crossed the border. Violence erupting at a construction site in Atlanta, the future home of a police training facility known as Cop City. 23 protesters now charged with domestic terrorism, why the site has become such a flashpoint in the community. Trump versus DeSantis, the two GOP heavyweights trading insults in what could be a preview of a 2024 Republican primary showdown. But how are their messages playing with voters? A troubling story out of California, a couple suing a fertility clinic for transferring the wrong embryo, one that contained a cancer gene they didn't want to pass on to their child. What the facility is saying about the devastating mistake, where police found this eight-foot reptile that had been kept as a pet for more than 20 years. Top story starts right now. And good evening. We begin top story tonight with that ongoing crisis in California. Residents trapped by the snow for nearly two weeks, some without heat, without food, and even without vital medications. This one image, take a look at this. It tells you everything you need to know about how dire that situation has become. The words help us written out in the snow that has left so many people stranded in the mountains outside of Los Angeles. Many of the most vulnerable people in this community unable to dig themselves out. Volunteers instead going door to door, climbing through the snow to deliver ready to eat meals and even insulin in some cases. All of this plus the roof of the only grocery store in Crestline collapsing, forcing the store to close. Volunteers handing out food in the parking lot instead, some unable to clear their driveways, walking several miles to come pick up supplies. And in Lake Arrowhead, new mom Stephanie Gillis forced to give birth at home without medical assistance after her midwife got trapped down the mountain. Gillis telling NBC News both she and her baby are now doing well. The need in that community is still so great tonight. NBC's Miguel Almaguer joins us now live from Crestline, California. Miguel, you were with those volunteers today delivering food and supplies. How difficult is it to reach these trapped residents? Well, Tom, it took hours to get from one house to another, and that was in a four-wheel drive vehicle because, of course, you're sludging through so many feet of snow. And I can tell you, just this morning, the snow snowfall finally stopped, but it gave way to clear skies and a better perspective of the damage like what you see behind me and just how widespread it is. Now, there is more snow in the forecast later on this week, and tonight there's still people trapped inside their homes. As blizzard-like conditions blanket California cities already buried under feet of snow. We have neighbors who are panicking. They're without, you know, food, power, heat, medications. For nearly two weeks now, trapped residents near Lake Arrowhead, just two hours outside of Los Angeles, have been pleading for help. Today, middle school teacher Steve Gaskell is a literal lifeline. His Jeep loaded with meals and insulin for Marissa Cupsack's uncle, who's stranded at home. And then Thank you. It's overwhelming because my husband can't even come home. He's stuck at the bottom of the hill. As the desperate ration food and medicine, mounds of snow are trapping the most vulnerable, who can't dig or plow their way out. It's, it's tough. It really is. Sorry. The National Guard and firefighters have been called in to help, but it's volunteers, some walking miles through waist-deep snow, making the difference. I think the first responders are overwhelmed with the sheer volume of calls that they're getting. With major roads being plowed, hand crews are slowly starting to reach senior citizens like Sydney White. I, I can't see myself getting out of here without them. But with more than nine feet of snowfall, the weight of these storms was far too great for the only grocery store in the community of Crestline. The parking lot, now a free food distribution site for residents like the Moncriefs, who were lucky to get past roadblocks. People want to go to their homes. 
Let them home. Tonight, the sense of desperation spelled out across this community as help finally arrives for some, but not all. All right, Miguel Almaguer joins us again live from Crestline, California. Miguel, I don't think it is an exaggeration to call this a crisis right now. Ongoing in California, so many in need. What's the situation with power and water there right now? Well, Tom, power and water is slowly coming back on for many people, but not quick enough. I want to give you a live picture from our drone. A short time ago, we talked about that grocery store that had a roof collapse. Buildings all across this area are under the weight of heavy snow. The building behind me, the front end is of this area is damaged, and also the roof collapsed as well. This type of problem is playing out all across this area. That heavy snowfall is still on rooftops all across this region. That's the growing concern going forward. Folks need to clear their roofs, but they can't even dig out of their front doors, at least as of right now, Tom. And Miguel, with that drone shot, you could see exactly what nine feet of snow can do to a structure like that. It's incredible. Any roofs are still standing. Miguel Almaguer and his team there in Crestline, California, covering that crisis for us. And California is bracing for more wild weather this week. So let's get right to Bill Karens with the forecast. Bill, what's the latest on the track? Well, Tom, I got four storms in the next 10 days. I mean, that's, uh, you know, no one in California wants to hear that. So we have two little storms right now on the West Coast. I say little. They're still going to dump up to 12 to 18 inches in the highest elevations of the central and northern Sierra. Yeah, Winter Brett, storm really nice warnings are out until uh, about 4 p.m. on Tuesday. And so tomorrow afternoon is when the storm will stop and this is the additional snowfall Yosemite northwards Mammoth southwards in Southern California we just saw all those pictures they're not getting snow from this storm but let me call your attention to what's going to happen as we go towards the end of this week we're going to have what we call an atmospheric river heading this way Thursday into Saturday the peak will be on Friday and this moisture plume is going to come out of the tropics it's going to dump a lot of heavy rain it's going to be warmer than the last storm so the snow levels will be really high so everyone with so much snow on their roofs it's almost going to be like a sponge soaking up that rainfall that's why a lot of people are going to be told, get the snow off your roof as fast as you can. This is how much rain could fall in this region. Six inches, seven inches, uh, three inches in Fresno, even, even San Francisco, three inches of rainfall. So we're going to get river flooding, mudslides, landslides. And then, of course, all the problems with that snow absorbing all that water, Tom, on those roofs. Roof collapse, a major issue into the weekend. A week worth of rain that we're seeing on your forecast. All right, Bill Cairns, we'll stay on top of this throughout the week. We want to take you out of Mexico where we're following another major breaking story. Authorities say criminals opened fire and then kidnapped four Americans just across the border from Brownsville, Texas. Chilling video appears to show the moment the Americans were abducted. The FBI investigating and asking for the public's help. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has the latest. These photos, shared widely on social media, appear to show the kidnapping's aftermath. The FBI says the four Americans entered Matamoros, Mexico Friday in a white minivan with North Carolina license plates before armed gunmen opened fire and abducted them. A law enforcement official with knowledge of the matter tells NBC News this video depicts part of the kidnapping, appearing to show one woman walking on her own, forced into a white pickup truck. Armed men with bulletproof vests are then seen dragging other people into the vehicle. We are closely following the assault and kidnapping of four U.S. citizens uh, in Mata Morosa, Mexico. Uh, these sorts of attacks are unacceptable. Authorities say a Mexican citizen was killed during the incident. A law enforcement official tells NBC News the Americans did not cross the border for any criminal purpose and that this appears to be a case of mistaken identity. Today, Mexico's president said they'd entered the country to buy medicine, although U.S. officials have not confirmed that. The Mexican government recently visited Matamoros to report on migrant tent camps for years, but violence there has escalated. The city of about half a million people just across the border from Brownsville, Texas, is home to warring factions of the Gulf drug cartel. The shootouts on Friday prompted the U.S. consulate to issue another security alert. Tonight, the FBI is offering a $50,000 reward for the safe return of the Americans. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us live tonight here on Top Story. So, Gabe, I know you have some new reporting on why the victims may have crossed the border? Yeah, that's right, Tom. The FBI has not confirmed these details. But just a short time ago, I spoke with a family member for one of those who was abducted. And she told me that the group had crossed the border for a medical procedure. And a U.S. law enforcement official with knowledge of the matter says it was cosmetic surgery. And tonight, the family of 
um, one of those who was abducted is pleading for the group's safe return at this point in time. The group apparently was from South Carolina, but had a rental car with North Carolina plates. And then, Gabe, I got to ask you, since you spoke with the family, how, how is the family doing right now? I can't imagine what it's like to see those images and possibly know your loved ones are in the hands of a Mexican cartel. Yeah, it's devastating, and they are praying for their safe return. But again, there are so many questions at this point. The Gulf cartel, of course, very powerful cartel in Mexico, although it has lost territory in recent years. And there were reports that it had uh, fractured a bit, and because of that, there have been this escalating violence in Mexico. But certainly, this family has so many questions at this point. All they want to know is when their family members might be brought home safe, Tom. All right, Gabe Gutierrez with a lot of new reporting for us on this story. For more on the ongoing violence there in Mexico, retired FBI agent Rob D'Amico joins us here in studio. I'm going to ask our director, uh, Rob, to basically play that video again. I want you to watch this frame by frame, okay? And walk our viewers through it because we're seeing armed men with what look like bulletproof vests or wearing some type of tactical gear. They're dragging these four Americans onto the bed of a pickup truck. What stands out to you here and, and what do you think is going, going on? Uh, Tom, the biggest thing is, one, it reminds me of Iraq in 06. Um, th they're not even hurrying. The, the freedom of action that they have right there is scary. You're talking about these other traffic, people just in traffic uh, stopping, well, no one's doing anything. People in traffic, but the, the, the guys with the guns and the vests, they're, they don't, they're not in a hurry. Unfortunately, it looks like three of them are injured. Uh, the one woman was put in the back of the pickup truck and the other ones were being dragged in there. So you have to assume right now that you have three injured and one alive. So you have the FBI leading this investigation. Yes, there, there is an FBI footprint in Mexico. We know that. What is the FBI doing right now? So right now it, it's chaotic. They're trying to find out who they need to talk to with the, the Mexican National Police. So they're looking for anyone that may have uh, information and whereabouts, but they're also looking, hey, who can we talk to about one, making sure that the medically, uh, the, the medical uh, help is being provided, and then talking to them about what can we do to get these people. But released. I mean, you were just telling us you, you saw how these men were acting. They clearly were not afraid of any type of law enforcement. You think the Mexican police will be able to pass on intel to the FBI? It, it, it's going to go further than that. It, Tom, one, it is. It well, the is, president of Mexico has addressed it, it so it it's clearly a national so, yeah, issue. Yeah, because they're worried about tourism, because these people are going down for medical, but there's also tons of tourism down there that is on jeopardy. We had, was it 21 state uh, attorney generals uh, appealing to uh, label cartels terrorists? So that's going to have fuel to it. So the Mexicans want this solved as much as we do. How much will the FBI negotiate with a, a Mexican drug cartel? Well, negotiation is one of those things. There's a book out there, Never Split the Difference, uh, that talks about how you negotiate a lie. You can't just split the difference down the road. Um, so you're going to start talking. What do they want? What would it take for them to get the, uh, the release of the, these uh, victims? You said it appeared some of the Americans are injured. We don't know if they are we or don't. not. We, we don't. But if they are injured, I mean, you talked about medical care here. I mean, is that even an option or are these people every minute counts at this point? It, it does. But the, I, I'm sure the cartels actually have their own doctors. So uh, if, if they have injured people uh, and they want to, to help, they're going to get them medical attention. Mexico's cartels are among the most violent gangs on the planet. Yeah. Do, do you think there is any room to negotiate one or to get these Americans back out alive? There always is. I, I negotiated with Afghan warlords that were just as violent, just as, and, and we talked to them. And, and you have to find out, again, what is it that they want in the background to, to get them out? Okay. Bob D'Amico, we thank you so much for joining thank Top you, Story tonight. Yeah, we also have some news from the U.S. northern border, an update to a story we first brought you two weeks ago. You may remember this. U.S. Customs and Border Patrol telling NBC News exclusively they will send an extra 25 agents to the Swanton sector near Vermont's border with Canada, effective immediately. A source telling NBC News some of the agents will be relocated from the southern border. You may remember Top Story sent our correspondent Valerie Castro to that area last month reporting on the influx of migrants flying from Mexico to Canada and then attempting to cross into the U.S. on foot, some even without shoes on, despite freezing temperatures, a trek that has unfortunately turned deadly for some. Okay, back here at home, a string of mid-air scares, the most recent involving a man who allegedly tried to open a plane's emergency exit door while in flight. He's then accused of trying to stab a flight attendant with a broken spoon. NBC's Tom Costello has that story along with two other disturbing events in the sky. 
It happened on a United flight from L.A. to Boston. Federal prosecutors say 45 minutes before landing, a male passenger attempted to open an exit door between first class and coach. When flight attendants confronted the man, he allegedly tried to stab one of them in the neck with a broken spoon. Fellow passengers tackled and subdued the passenger until the plane landed in Boston. 33-year-old Francisco Torres tonight being held on federal charges. <laughs> Meanwhile, smoke and panic on Southwest Flight 3923 Sunday. The 737 hit by birds as it took off from Havana, Cuba, headed for Fort Lauderdale. The engine exploded and on fire. Terrified passengers donned oxygen masks as the crew circled back, making an emergency landing in Havana. Smoke started coming into the cabin, and they just had to stay in your seats, and we had to start breathing. Bird strikes are common, but rarely cause serious damage. The miracle on the Hudson landing in 2009 came after a flock of geese took out both of the plane's engines. Meanwhile, tragedy on board a private plane when a passenger, 55-year-old Dana Hyde of Maryland, was killed as the Bombardier Challenger plane hit severe turbulence. The plane flying from New Hampshire to Virginia, making an emergency landing in Connecticut. The NTSB says the pilots were dealing with a trim issue at the time. Time, suggesting they may have hit clear air turbulence in a jet stream moving 50 to 100 miles an hour faster than normal. Clear air turbulence is not something that radar shows, so pilots are unable to uh, see it in advance. Every year, passengers and crew members suffer head lacerations, broken bones, and bruises in severe turbulence. This is exactly why we tell you to wear your seatbelt, because if you're not wearing your seatbelt when severe turbulence like this happens, it can actually be deadly. The incidents are rare, but they come as the FAA prepares for an aviation safety summit nationwide next week. Tom? Okay, Tom Costello for us, Tom. We appreciate it. Now to power and politics and the growing divide within the Republican Party over who will be their leader. Over the weekend, Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis speaking to supporters while also appearing to trade shots at one another. Our Von Hilliard spoke to the former president as he headlined the CPAC conference. Tonight, the battle lines in the fight for the Republican Party now drawn. Right now, all polls show it's Trump versus DeSantis, and the Florida governor has yet to even enter the race. The former president painting himself as the leader of a revenge movement. I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. During Trump's featured speak on Saturday at CPAC, an annual gathering of conservative activists, he blasted leaders from the past. We are never going back to the party of Paul Ryan, Karl Rove, and Jeb Bush. Okay. While taking thinly veiled shots at his strongest potential competitor, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. We're not going back to people that want to destroy our great social security system. Even some in our own party. I wonder who that might be. DeSantis once discussed potentially privatizing Social Security, an idea he's backed off since. Trump also doing a complete 180 on mail-in ballots, saying he still wants to get rid of them, but has no choice but to accept them for now. I will move heaven and earth to fully and finally secure our elections. All Republican governors should immediately go for paper ballots, one-day voting, and voter ID. But until that day comes, Republicans must compete using every lawful means to win. That means swamping the left with mail-in votes, early votes, and election day votes. Have to do it. By Sunday, Governor DeSantis, speaking at the Reagan Library in California, apparently taking his own dig at the former president's time in the White House. Uh, you didn't see our administration leaking like a sieve. You didn't see a lot of drama or palace intrigue. What you saw was surgical precision execution day after day after day. DeSantis right now, the only candidate competitive with Trump in the polls. Though at CPAC, Trump easily won the unscientific CPAC straw poll, 62% to DeSantis's 20%. A lot of the folks that we talked to out here say that they'd love to see a Trump-DeSantis ticket. What do you tell them would you consider asking Ron DeSantis right now to be your vice presidential pick? Well, I've always had a great relationship with Ron. I was the one that made it possible for him to win. He was at a very low number, and after I endorsed him, he went up by a lot, and he asked me to do that. I've always had a good relationship with him, but it's much too early to talk about. Why should he not be the presidential candidate for Republicans? 
Well, he can be if he wants to be. Why should the folks not turn to him if he makes the case of being a new well, generation? I, I think I've done something that nobody else has been able to do. We turned around this country. Other Republicans, like New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu, still weighing a 2024 run. But on Meet the Press, Sununu, a Trump critic, acknowledging the strength of DeSantis as the Trump alternative. Right now, if the election were today, Ron DeSantis would win in New Hampshire. There's no doubt about that in my mind. CPAC now seen as a Trump event. His loyalists dominating the crowds. Trump, hello. I mean, it's got to be the president. I don't trust anybody else to run this country but him. And as far as DeSantis, I don't trust anybody else to run the state of Florida than him. So he needs to stay right where he is and not go anywhere. Now, Tom, this was a defining reception for Trump here this weekend. These are the types of grassroots conservative activists that if you're going to mount a, a serious campaign, you really need to get the backing of here. And when he took that stage, there were thousands in attendance, maybe not the biggest CPAC crowd ever, but there were thousands in attendance that enthusiastically received him. And if you compare that to Nikki Haley, who uh, is really his main primary challenger at this point, and who also did take the stage over the weekend, well, it was a friendly reception. It was far from an enthusiastic one. And Mike Pompeo, who is his former Secretary of State and also considering a bid, it was also a tepid response to him up on stage. Fine, welcoming, but it was not that of Donald Trump here. And so coming off of a week of good poll results and enthusiastic response, he's going to Iowa a week from today, uh, feeling very good about where his standing is as this Republican primary uh, field really begins to take shape. Okay, Von Hilliard for us, Von, we appreciate that. For more on CPAC and the future of the Republican Party, I want to bring in our political panelists tonight here on Top Story. First up, Carlos Grubello. He's a former, former Florida representative and NBC News political analyst. And Amisha Cross is a Democratic strategist and political contributor. Thank you both for joining Top Story. Carlos, I'm going to start with you and your party, the Republicans. Uh, we, we heard from President Trump there in his CPAC speech. I know you heard the speech as well. It was about two hours long. And he, he really sort of honing his message. It sounded a little bit like 2016, but he was essentially painting himself as a savior to make sure he saves Republicans from not going back to the George W. Bush era of Republican politics and Karl Rove. Is that a message that will catch fire with Republican voters, you think? Well, Tom, in a Republican primary, that message can be effective. The Trump coalition really included uh, some of those old Bush Republicans, but those people aren't there anymore. Those people have since left. In 2016, they were with them. In 2020, a lot of those people actually voted for Joe Biden, which is why Trump lost. So now Trump is going back to the well, going to that hardcore MAGA base and trying to get them excited to see if he can get enough to win the primary. He's doing well. I mean, he's still the dominant force in the Republican Party. His grip on the party isn't as tight as it used to be. His poll numbers are good. And Misha, I want to bring you in on this. It's kind of interesting. Former President Trump is campaigning against establishment Republicans, but you could make the argument that Trump is the establishment Republican now. Absolutely. Trump ran as an outsider. He ran to try to make sure that he was telling people that he was outside of Washington. He was the anti-establishment. When he got in, he decided to, and again, his tactics weren't establishment at all, but what he has done is coalesce forces, not only for those who are known as, you know, the far-right extremists, but there are also a ton of folks who will hold their nose and vote Donald Trump. I still tell everyone, do not do not believe that the era of Trump is over or that Trump cannot get these votes. We've seen this man pull a rabbit out of his hat more times than I can count at this point. And he's still, you know, going around telling people that the election in 2020 was stolen, that he's still, you know, the rightful president. He's someone who is still pushing extremist narratives. He's someone who sounds a lot like what we're seeing, what Ron DeSantis is doing in Florida, only he is doing it in the Trump fashion that he always has. And even though it may seem that certain leaders of the party are kind of moving away from him. I don't necessarily believe that. We know from the people who have been amplified in the um, in the Republican Congress right now, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, um, the Speaker of the House, that Trumpism is still alive and well, and it would not shock me if he walked off with his party's nomination. Uh, Misha, you brought up former, uh, or I should say current governor, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Carlos, I want to ask you about him. He had that big speech at the Reagan Library there in, in Simi Valley in California. I want to put up on the screen some of the sort of phrases he's using, some of the flashpoint phrases he's getting, because he wants people to sort of buy into his campaign. We should put them on the screen now. When common sense suddenly becomes an uncommon virtue, talking about this time post-pandemic and during the pandemic, this woke mind virus and this Faucian dystopia. 
This obviously has read me for Republican voters, a lot of Republican voters who were upset during the pandemic and afterwards with the regulations and the lockdowns. Is this going to light his campaign on fire? Is this going to really catch on with Republican voters? Well, Tom, Ron DeSantis knows that he has to steal votes from Donald Trump, and that's why he throws this red meat out there. He knows he has the Bush Republicans. Those people want anyone other than Donald Trump, and they like Ron DeSantis. They think he's competent. They think he's good enough for them. So what uh, DeSantis is trying to do is build a coalition of those old school Republicans, maybe some younger Republicans, but he does need at least a portion of that Trump base to get past the primary. So even though he's uh, holding on to these more traditional elements of the Republican Party, he has to reach for that Trump base and he has to tell that Trump base, hey, I'm just as good as Trump, except I can win. Trump's candidates lost in the uh, midterm elections, I won big in the state of Florida. Amisha, we have some polls I want to put up. It's essentially the current president, Joe Biden, up against both Ron DeSantis and up against former President Trump. You see the poll numbers here. They're both very tight. Who do you think Democrats would rather Joe Biden run against, to be completely honest with our top story viewers? Well, we've seen Joe Biden beat Donald Trump before. So I think that, honestly, a, a Joe Biden versus Donald Trump matchup would be something that's glorious for, for Democrats, partially because we know what Trump's playbook is. He always goes back to the exact same well. DeSantis is a little bit of a mixed bag. I think that he's been able to push his anti-CRT narrative. He's been able to carry anti-LGBT tones. He's been able to um, basically create in the state of Florida a lot of the oppression and the levels of uh, civil rights dismantlement that we have not seen in general generations in this country. And I think that it would be a much harder thing, quite frankly, to not fully know what to expect from a Ron DeSantis if he was to, you know, receive this nomination. With Trump, we already know. We've seen it twice. Uh, Amisha, as I have you, I want to ask you also, you know, the current president hasn't officially launched his reelection campaign just yet. All signs are pointing to that being the case. But in a recent interview over the weekend with CBS, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, he teased a potential 2024 run. Let's take a look. You said, let's see who all the players are when it comes to running for president. You've said you're not running for president. Is that an open question, though? Who, I didn't who do you say think that. I didn't say anything about that. I, the bottom line is I will make my political decision in December, whatever it may be. To run for president? I'm not taking anything off the table, and I'm not, put, and I'm not putting anything on the table. I said I'll make a decision in Jan at, this, at the end of this year. All right, Amisha, cut through the politics here for us. Do you really think Senator Joe Manchin is going to run for president? Absolutely not. I, I would question who his base actually is. This is the same Joe Manchin who made it extremely difficult for the Democratic priorities that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris ran on to actually get elected. And this is the same Joe Manchin who toasts the Republican line a lot more than is appreciated by the Democratic voter base. Absolutely not. I think Joe Manchin enjoys being in news headlines. And because he because of the current makeup of the uh, of the Senate, he doesn't have those news headlines anymore. And he's just trying to make himself seem like a leader all over again. Joe Manchin is a joke, and this is just one of many times where he has proven it. Carlos, I'll let you have the final thought. Uh, imagine for a second, I know this is going to be really hard for you, you're, you're leading the Democratic Party. Would you have a plan B, and what I mean by a plan B is a, another candidate ready to go in case President Biden either says he's not going to run or he says he's going to run and then something happens in two years. Democrats need a plan B, Tom, because if it's anyone other than Donald Trump, Joe Biden is going to have a difficult time winning. Joe Biden's poll numbers are still low. The only reason that the 2022 midterms worked out for Democrats are because Republicans put forward horrible candidates. If Republicans put forward a competent, youngish candidate for president, Democrats ought to worry. You think President Biden is still the best hope for Democrats, though, to win re-election? If Donald Trump is the Republican nominee, yes, because he has proven that he can beat Donald Trump. Okay, Carlos Grubello, Amisha Cross, we thank you both for a great discussion. Still ahead tonight, right here on Top Story, a deadly plane crash outside of New York City. We have the video tonight showing the moment the single-engine plane crashed into a neighborhood. The sad news we're learning about who was on board. Plus, the disturbing IVF, IVF mix-up, a fertility clinic allegedly transferring an embryo with a deadly genetic mutation by mistake. The action the affected couple is now taking, causing a nightmare for one family. The family using genetic testing on their embryos to prevent a family genetic mutation that could be deadly. But now in a lawsuit, they're claiming the fertility center not only used the wrong embryo, but tried to cover it up. NBC's Valerie Castro has this one. 
Tonight, an apparent medical mix-up leaves a California family and their one-year-old son facing an uncertain and devastating future. 100% trusted them. I, I, they're doctors. Melissa and Jason Diaz filing a lawsuit and an arbitration claim of negligence against Huntington Reproductive Center Fertility after they say the Pasadena Clinic wrongly transferred an embryo carrying a cancer gene and tried to cover it up. The couple specifically sought out IVF and genetic testing to prevent a stomach cancer mutation known as CDH1 from continuing in the family line. It turned out to be the biggest mistakes of our lives. Jason was diagnosed with that cancer in 2018. His stomach removed after chemotherapy failed. Two other family members have died of the disease. I wouldn't want anyone on earth to experience this type of pain. And just picturing my happy baby boy going through that, my, my world just crushed. The couple gave birth in September of 2021 and discovered the mistake months later when they planned to try for another child with the embryos they'd stored. According to the lawsuit, the couple says they were sent this report with handwritten notes confirming an embryo with the mutation was transferred in their first successful pregnancy. My heart sank, like knowing what my husband has gone through, the difficulties that his family have gone through the ones that have removed their stomach to avoid getting cancer. The lawsuit also alleges those handwritten notes were removed on another copy of the same report sent after Melissa began to ask questions. And what ultimately what HRC Fertility sent to Melissa were records that were altered in a fundamental way, taking out which embryos it had transferred. When asked about the mistake and allegations of a cover-up, HRC Fertility told NBC News in a statement that it empathizes with the family and it stands by the, quote, professionalism and expertise of its medical staff, but adds, quote, the patients associated with the case sought genetic testing and genetic counseling outside of HRC Fertility and with an outside party, and goes on to say the clinic carried out the family's wishes to transfer a male embryo with the highest level of care. Cooper Genomics issued a perfectly good valid report that properly stated the gene characteristics of the various embryos. The problem, which HRC Fertility was not admitting in its response, was that HRC Fertility just read the report wrong. That mistake, the Diaz's say in their lawsuit, means their son has an 80% chance of developing the cancer that will likely lead to a lifetime of health issues. How do I prepare my son for what comes next. He's just such a happy baby. And to know the hurt in front of him that he has to face for something that we tried so hard to prevent, it, it crushes me, it hurts my soul. The family's attorney says they're hoping the fertility company takes responsibility for the mistake and makes changes to their policies and procedures as a result. Melissa and Jason say at some point they do want to continue to expand their family in the future. Tom. Okay, Valerie Castro for us tonight. Valerie, thank you. When we come back, California versus Walgreens. Governor Newsom saying the state's done doing business with the major retailer. Why abortion pills are at the middle of this battle. And the deadly concert stampede what sent fans of Glorilla rushing out of a venue in upstate New York. And what we've just learned from police. Stay with us. All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the deadly plane crash on New York's Long Island. A home security cam capturing the moment the single-engine plane crashed into a neighborhood. We're learning a mother who was on board with her daughter has died. Daughter and a pilot now in critical condition. No one on the ground was hurt. This happened in Suffolk County. An attorney for the flight school that operates the plane told NBC New York the aircraft, the aircraft passed an inspection just last week. A second person has died following a stampede at a concert in upstate New York. Authorities say the stampede broke out when fans at a Glorilla concert in Rochester thought they heard gunfire. At least two people killed, several others hurt. Police say there's no evidence of a gun being fired. California's Governor Gavin Newsom says the state will no longer do business with Walgreens over a decision on abortion pills. Walgreens announced last week that it would not sell abortion pills by mail in 20 states. That decision came after a letter sent by those states' attorney general warned Walgreens and other major pharmacies that the sales violate the state's abortion laws. However, current FDA policy will allow retail pharmacies to sell the pill anywhere if they are certified under an agency program. Walgreens has not commented on Newsom's statement. And more than one million cars by some of the top car manufacturers are currently being recalled. 
700,000 Nissan Rogues recalled over an issue with the ignition key, and nearly 100,000 Ford Rangers from 2004 to 2006 have been included in an airbag recall. Tesla, Dodge, Jeep, and Toyota also issuing recalls over the last week on everything from loose bolts to transmission issues. And an eight-foot alligator was found living in a Texas backyard. New video shows the large gator being removed from the home outside of Austin. Officials say the homeowner had kept the alligator as a pet for several years. Texas Parks and Wildlife say it was well taken care of. However, it had, a grown, it had outgrown its habitat, and that alligator should never be kept as pets. It was taken to a nearby zoo, and that homeowner was cited. Okay, we want to turn out of the violent scene at the site of a planned public safety training facility outside of Atlanta. Protesters hurling fireworks at police and setting fires. Now nearly two dozen people are facing domestic terrorism charges. Blaine Alexander has the details. In Atlanta, a chaotic clash. Atlanta police released this video that they say shows rioters throwing fireworks at officers and setting construction vehicles and a trailer on fire. In the end, 23 charged with domestic terrorism. You throw Molotov cocktails, large rocks, a uh, number of items at officers, your only intent is to harm. Police call it a coordinated attack by violent agitators. Of the 23 arrested, only two are from Georgia. While protesters say it all started at a family-friendly music festival and that officials used excessive force to arrest some who were not involved. All of it centered around a planned public safety training center that opponents have dubbed Cop City. The planned site is right here, 85 acres just outside of Atlanta, a training facility for both Atlanta police and fire. Now, officers have been stationed nearby, but they say they're going to increase their presence in the coming days. Officials touted as a way to improve community policing. This is where your community and neighborhood watch programs will, will learn uh, uh, how to uh, keep your neighborhood safe. But critics say it will do just the opposite. 90 acres of the forest are going to be destroyed right away to build Cop City. So we see this as a further militarization of the police. This is the latest flashpoint in a fight that has stretched well over a year. In January, a protester was killed, a Georgia State Patrol trooper injured. Tonight, protesters say that this is just the start of a week of demonstrations. And Tom, you can see that charred equipment right there behind me. Police have already stepped up their presence here in the area. For much of the day, you could hear police choppers circling overhead, and they say in the coming days, they will be ready. Tom. A wild scene there, though. Okay, Blaine, thank you. In Ohio, another derailment by a Norfolk Southern train. This one just a month after that toxic explosion in East Palestine. All as there's growing outrage over the response by the rail company and the federal government. Jesse Kirsch reports. Tonight, the NTSB is investigating another Norfolk Southern crash in Ohio, the company's fourth derailment in this state in less than five months. The Springfield train wreck caught on camera. The company says 28 cars went off the track this weekend with two crew members on board. No injuries or public health threats were reported. 212 rail cars, uh, some of which were tank cars transporting hazardous material. Norfolk Southern says the cars with hazardous materials were not among those that derailed. Today, the company promising more investment in sensors that detect overheated wheel bearings. Even one derailment is too many, and yet the average in recent years has been several every single day. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says railroad standards need to change. But it's really the entire industry that has been pushing hard to water down or delay safety regulations. Is it now time to try figuring out a way to possibly pause Norfolk Southern's operations until these investigations are completed? Well, the reality is that our economy depends on a strong freight rail network operating 24-7. We shouldn't have to shut down the, the rail system of this country in order to make sure that it is safe. Still, some residents here don't fully trust what they're hearing from officials after last month's toxic derailment in East Palestine more than 200 miles away. I don't know if it's frustrating, but it's just kind of scary that I'm sure there are safety protocols in place. Maybe they're not being followed. Bipartisan calls for rail safety reform growing. Meanwhile, Norfolk Southern's trains here once again on the move. Tom? Okay, Jesse, thank you. Up next on Top Story, the race to restore. Nearly four years after that devastating fire, officials in France have now set a reopening date for the famed Notre Dame Cathedral when visitors can book that trip to Paris and the iconic piece set to go up this year. Stay with us.
Back now with Top Stories Global Watch and the deadly suicide bombing targeting police in southwestern Pakistan. Officials say the attacker was on a motorcycle when he ran into a police truck and detonated the bomb. At least 10 officers killed and a dozen injured. Two militant groups, including ISIS, have claimed responsibility. It's the latest in a string of attacks on police in Pakistan, including a mosque bombing you may remember in January that killed 100 people. North Korea accusing the U.S. of intentionally ramping up tensions after joint military drills with South Korea. New video shared by South Korea's defense ministry shows Warplanes from the U.S. and South Korea training together off the coast of the Korean Peninsula. You see them here. It includes a B-52 bomber capable of carrying nuclear weapons. The Allies announcing they would conduct large-scale military drills later this month. And the famed Notre Dame Cathedral has a reopening date. Officials in France say the Paris landmark will reopen to the public in December 2024, less than six years after its roof and iconic spire were destroyed during that massive fire. That 315-foot spire said to gradually start reappearing above the cathedral this year as it's rebuilt. And we thank you for watching Top Story. Also, a special thank you to our friends here at the Telemundo Center for hosting us in Miami tonight. I'm Tom Yamas. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.